All right, well, I suppose I will just get going here. Uh, my name is Matthias Search. I'm a data technician with the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative. I've been working on this data rescue project for about a year now, and today I will share with you all the bigger takeaways from this project. All right, so before we get going, just a few webinar mechanics. Uh, this will be recorded and available online if you want to revisit this material or share it with others. Uh, I will also ask you to mute your microphone and turn off your video just to reduce distraction. And I do have Jake Vendersen here today. He will be managing the chat box on the side of the screen. Um, if you can think of any questions, feedback, suggestions for the project, we can circle around at the end. And then if you wanna make this more of a webinar-like experience, you can uh, click the three dots in the corner of my window here uh, and pin my video and it will move the video to the top of the screen. So today I will start by talking about just the background of the data rescue project, uh, ways that we approached the data rescue process, what we were able to accomplish throughout the year, uh, identifying value in old data, and then the obstacles that we ran into. So Data Rescue was identified as a regional project for 2019 by the FEMC Steering Committee and our state partnerships. Um, that was our five-state cooperative before Connecticut and Rhode Island joined us in the mix. This project being identifying at-risk data. So this is more of the gathering of information portion of our mission, uh, but it was also an opportunity to provide assistance to the partners that we have worked with uh, over the past 30 years or so. So when I say at-risk data, uh, the big risks that I'm talking about here are natural disasters. This image here is of the Waterbury Natural Resources buildings that were flooded in 2011 after a tropical storm Irene came through. The process to recover the data in these buildings was extremely expensive. So this is just an effort to get ahead of something like that happening. And obviously there's the just general wear and tear to material over time. So this is identifying any material that's just sitting in an old filing cabinet or on an old hard drive, no real publication mandate, it's just gonna keep sitting there. We did run into a bit of file extinction with this project. Uh, so you may feel like your data is safe just sitting on a hard drive, but the software that can read uh, those data just fades out of use and you can no longer read uh, a lot of these data. Uh, so we did deal with a bit of file conversion, converting files into CSVs or comma separated files that can be easily read, uh, less prone to corruption over time. And lastly, I have included here staff turnover uh, as people move on to different jobs, as people retire, these are the people who know most intimately what's going on with their data. They know what the fields mean of their data, uh, the units that everything was collected in. So the two main objectives for this uh, project were just identifying all the at-risk material across the region. This is anything that can relate back to the forest ecosystem in any way. Uh, so it could be tree health data, wildlife surveys that were collected within a forested habitat, uh, soils data, air quality, uh, climate data, or uh, any sort of stream, water, uh, lake data that can be related loosely back to the forested ecosystem. Our second objective here was for the FEMC to rescue as much data that we could over the year. And so this became a process of identifying the priority uh, material that really contributed most to our understanding of uh, the forests in the Northeast. So we compiled a list of all our existing partners and then uh, just a broader net of all uh, natural resources organizations 
and uh, conducted a broad outreach effort to reach as many of these organizations that we could. Uh, some organizations we communicated with several people within a single organization, uh, but these, these were state and federal agencies, academic institutions, and non-governmental organizations. From our outreach effort, we were able to start conversations with 40 organizations that let us know about their data rescue needs. Uh, we did also get responses that were just saying, this is a great idea, but I don't have the time, mental capacity to engage with any sort of uh, additional project. So we heard back from about 40 organizations and often one organization had several uh, projects that they needed rescued. So our approach to data rescue after our outreach effort was creating just a large list of everything out there, uh, indicating the needs to each project, identifying the priorities from the hundreds of projects that we identified. Uh, so prioritizing which projects that we could actually spend our resources in, in rescuing. A lot of the time this meant uh, just creating a digital version so scanning a paper copy, anything that will help us archive the data. The end goal for a lot of these projects were just, I need a home for these data. And uh, so we were able to put a lot of these projects onto the FEMC archive. And then lastly, just trying to utilize the data, extract as much uh, value from these, uh, these projects that we could. This really took whatever form that the organizations told us they needed from the data. So uh, it could be digitizing polygons from aerial detection surveys, um, extracting extreme weather events from forest health reports, species names from field notes, uh, anything that really helped uh, increase the value. All right, so this is what our uh, inventory uh, initially looked like. We have our contact information on the left there, and then a detailed description of what the actual project was. This included the format of the material, how many pages it might be, um, should it be available only upon request, or is it all right to be publicly available? We also have the start and end years of the data, uh, spatial extent, and then our ecosystem components being forest, water, wildlife, soil, and air. And lastly, uh, really identifying what we needed to do with the project to be able to categorize it as rescued. To prioritize uh, which projects we should actually be focusing on here, uh, we developed an index. Uh, this accounted for the spatial coverage, the temporal coverage, and institutional value. So projects that spanned uh, more years would trickle to the top of our list. And then institutional value that could be more subjective. These data would be more uh, valuable to a broader audience. Um, it addresses a particularly uh, pressing concern relating to the forests, or the organization told us this is something that we would really benefit from if you were able to uh, rescue. Uh, so we did this with each project, listing it all out, sorting it. We, we used this to guide what we should be focusing on and actually had a FEMC staff meeting to choose the high priority projects to rescue. What we ended up with is working a lot with the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation scanning a lot of their annual health, forest health reports, uh, their continuous forest inventory uh, data sheets, and uh, aerial detection survey maps. Uh, we worked with uh, Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation uh, with their uh, sugar maple decline surveys, digitizing the stack of printout from the 80s. We also helped uh, personnel as they retired uh, with file organization uh, file conversion from old files. Uh, this fun project from the Cary Institute is working with Michael Kudish's field notes from the 60s onward to today. 
we scanned a lot of these handwritten notes and actually started the digitization process of picking out species mentions from each page. And we identified that as a value that uh, was recognized by researchers that actually use these data. We also worked with the Society of, uh, for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests. We scanned a lot of their aerial imagery and geo-referenced this so that they could quickly identify change in their forests uh, in their property over time. In total, what we were able to accomplish is scanning more than 18,000 pages. So that scanning, the, the creating a digital version of the material was an important step here. We scanned that aerial imagery and then digitizing a lot of this material. That's the Kudish field notes, uh, forest health reports, and the aerial detection surveys. We digitized quite a bit of uh, vernal pool slides and then the file conversion and, and actually a disproportionately large amount of time just reformatting data sets so that they could fit nicely into the FEMC archive. And because that did take a disproportionately large amount of time, I'll just go into that real quickly, what that might look like. This is one tab of an Excel file. Uh, what you're seeing here is just, uh, this could be one data set. This is an analysis and then results from the study. We have the project title and descriptions of the project and then results at the bottom. So when we would see something like that, what we really are looking for is something simple that the archive can recognize and pull information from. So all of this, this is metadata that we can include in the FEMC archive. It doesn't have to be in the, the actual file itself, but with a simplified CSV file, uh, we can quickly identify the sugar maple, the years that are referenced and data that is relevant here. Uh, so this one tab on Excel turns into several CSV files. Uh, at the end of the day, though, we do archive the actual Excel file as the, the raw data um, because a lot of information is stored in how it is formatted also. What we're also able to accomplish is creating an actual data rescue inventory, which I am excited about. I do want to spend just a little bit of time poking around. So I'm going to open up the actual data rescue inventory page here. And this is the URL. We will send out uh, email and, and we can list that there as well. But so this is our project. We have just a minute and a half quick overview of what the data rescue project is. You have the ability to suggest a rescue if you hear about something that needs to be rescued in your organization or you've you've heard about something it, it's not incredibly important what you type here um, aside from your email address so we can contact you but this is really just to get that conversation started and we do have prompts uh, start and end date of the data spatial extent uh, what is required to complete the rescue and then just anything else that you feel is relevant there. In the About uh, tab up here, you also have access to our data rescue report. And this just goes more in detail of the whole process and how you might be able to replicate that if you have your own data rescue needs. In the inventory itself, we have the uh, organization map where you can visualize where the data is across the region. It's pretty neat to see uh, where everything's coming from. You can click on it and then just go right to the inventory itself. These are uh, 330 entries to our data rescue inventory. If you click on an item, you'll be able to see a description of the project, uh, whether or not the project needs rescued, and um, contact information, as well as what is required for that project to be rescued. On the left here, we have just a search. You can type in any particular subject that you're interested in. We can look at 
a project that has a data set in it, uh, a state that you're interested in, the span of the study, the ecosystem components, or sort by what needs rescued and what doesn't. Hey guys, uh, Jake here. I'd like to take a brief moment just to remind all, um, you can go to the bottom of your screen and open up the chat and ask any questions whatsoever you want to direct to Matthias um, in that chat box and we can address them at the end of this talk. Thanks, Jake. All right, one other thing I wanted to show you is these do direct back to the FEMC archive if it is a, uh, a project we have started a project page for. And just to quickly show you what that might look like, this is the file information. Going to the project page, um, we see tags that allow people to quickly identify what the project is about, the spatial extent of the data. Um, if it is sensitive information, you can just do a general polygon around the study area or leave that information out. And again, if, if you are working with sensitive information, any of these projects can be available only upon request, if that's important. So identifying the value in old data. Uh, a lot of this work is retaining institutional knowledge, building off the information that we've collected in the past. Uh, a lot of these old data sets are the product of a lot of work and um, and so this is just shining a light on these data. Ways to really make use of these data are um, allowing them to be a, a baseline for our knowledge of the forests so we can replicate old studies. And Richard Premick, uh, our, our speaker for the 2019 conference, really illustrated this with his climate change project. Uh, he rescued essentially when in the year flowers bloomed with the same plants and recreated those data sets. I also included looking at data in new ways. Through this project, we identified in New Hampshire, there's a lot of sugar maple sap dates and quantity of, of maple syrup produced over the years, just scribbled on sugar house walls. In many cases, someone will come to us and say, I just have a lot of data, I don't know what to do with it, and you'll find really interesting things that way. The main obstacle that we encountered was uh, a lack of time. Uh, so partner engagement was difficult. Uh, again, people would tell us that they're interested in working with us, uh, but they really just don't have time. And these are the people who would actually benefit the most from any sort of data rescue effort. An obstacle again was our own time. We can't uh, get to all of the rescues, but if we do hear that this is uh, an effort that our partners are interested in continuing, we can uh, account for that for the next few years. I did run into scanner speed. That was often a weakest link in how quickly we could finish these projects. Uh, this larger printer here would, well, it's a lot slower. And we wound up upgrading to a feeder scanner that really helped us finish the projects. Character recognition software could be uh, under time as well. We weren't able to find some software that really worked for us. So if any of you have suggestions for what we might be able to use, we would use something that uh, created the text, but it wouldn't be in the format we needed, which was difficult for any sort of a data sheet. So uh, any suggestions there would be really helpful. And then lastly, uh, one huge obstacle to this work is that each project is really uh, specific in its needs. There's no one size fits all. But we do want to be available as a resource. If you recognize a data rescue need, uh, please reach out to us. We want to be that resource for you. Uh, we might not have the answers for everything, but we can uh, keep that conversation going. And really, we are here to assist our partners there. Uh, we do have a 
fee for service option. If you have projects that you would like us to work on that don't fit into our current capacity, uh, we can we can talk about the specifics with that as well. I do want to acknowledge the USDA Forest Service for a lot of the funding and logistical support. Again, the University of Vermont, which uh, provided us with data technicians. Uh, they were really instrumental in our scanning and digitization process. The Vermont Department of Forests and Parks, uh, Forest Parks and Recreation, and then anyone who just took the time to work with us. And with that, I will open the chat up to any questions. Hi, Matthias. So uh, no questions at the moment, uh, which I encourage anyone to ask um, or clarifications on anything Matthias has talked about throughout this discussion. But um, personally, Matthias, I have a couple questions. Um, just from sharing an office space with you, I see the extent of some of these processes. And um, I was wondering if you can go into a little more depth just when it comes to projects or, um, or data sets in particular that you're rescuing. Um, perhaps the Kudish one, because that is a project that speaks in particular to me. So we did get a team together to pick out all the, the references to different species. Uh, it's just been a really fun project reading through his notes and setting up the process to digitize. And this framework could be used for any sort of data. We used just a file sharing process where we could upload uh, the scans from the field notes and then from there, anyone throughout the region, throughout the world really can, can open those files and help us with the digitization. Uh, so here's a great example of the first step is just getting that digital copy so that you're not, you're not just stuck with the actual physical location of the uh, paper. And so in this way, you could, you could use these forced health reports. Those are now uh, in a digital form. Uh, you can call upon colleagues in another university. Maybe they have a few eager interns that want to help out in some way. Uh, they don't have to be in the actual location. And that reminds me, uh, a lot of this work, this could be a great resource for grad students if they're looking for a project. Um, so there's an opportunity there to create just a larger project with several different organizations or those uh, organizations can come together, uh, collaborate and pool their resources to get these pages rescued. And so the FEMC in collaboration can, can assist with that process. Great, thanks Matthias, that answers that question. Um, another thought that I just had was, um, I see a lot of these um, data projects that you go through and I'm wondering a little bit more about the process of them. So um, at the beginning stages, what is your vision for these projects and um, how do you come about that? I understand you do some sort of consulting um, with the data owner, um, but I'm wondering if you have like a, a finished product in mind at the beginning stages of these, or if it's a more of like an ongoing process. The vision is really driven by the owner of the data. So if someone reaches out to us, they're telling us they want uh, this project to be rescued. We then set up uh, any sort of meeting that could be over the phone, uh, sending a few emails back and forth. Often it took the form of actually going out to the site, uh, having a site visit and looking at the actual data to get a sense of what it might require. And so we try not to overextend ourselves. Uh, realistic expectation, maybe tier one, we get it archived. And then if we have time, what can we do on top of that? How can we maximize the value of this uh, information? So it's an ongoing process. First, reach out to us, then we set up the meeting. Uh, we talk about what the, the actual project needs and um, it, it really is an evolving process throughout the whole thing.
So again, each project is different. It's an ongoing conversation the whole time. Great, thank you, Matthias. Um, so it appears the extent of this is somewhat endless. So that definitely opens the door for um, the future of this project, which is mm -hmm. awesome. Um, so there's no questions currently that are rolling in in the chat, um, but because there's just a few people on this webinar, I would like to invite anyone who would like to, to unmute themselves and ask any questions personally to Matthias or myself and we can make it more of like an open discussion. Oh, here's a question. Not, not a question, just appreciation. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thanks for putting this together. It, it is useful to see what you've worked through and um, we're trying to take on a similarly daunting task. Well, we can, uh, we can start a conversation if, um, if you're finding you have rescue needs. Was this helpful, just a walk through the whole project? Yeah, it was kind of seeing that the process of setting up the inventory and your prioritization is is where we're at right now. We've done kind of a, a base inventory level and trying to figure out how to how to just organize that and you know get that um, inventory available to people just so folks know what is out there and start the archiving based off of that. Yeah, and really, my ideal situation is for this project to take a life of its own. So instead of reaching out to all these organizations every year, just a, a general knowledge that this resource is out there. I have this, these papers sitting around. Oh, I know that FEMC is doing a data rescue. I'll just put my, uh, my project in and people will see it from there. Yeah, no, I, that, that, is, that is helpful definitely. And, and trying to, whatever we end up developing for a system, maybe making sure it kind of, kind of go hand in hand with your archiving process. Well, awesome. All right, well, I am happy just leaving it there. Um, please reach out to us if you have any other questions or comments or just want to uh, talk about this project some more. Uh, so thank you.